Great. Uh, well, it's lovely to be here today. I'm sorry I'm a, a little bit late. I think I was scheduled to be uh, uh, speaking a little bit earlier, but uh, got a, a little bit tied up this morning. And uh, thank you for the uh, lovely introduction. And uh, to start off, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking today here on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I want to thank you, a big thank you to the organizers here uh, for bringing people together for this very, very important conversation conversation and I think it's one of the silver linings of uh, the, the pandemic which is now we can have events for people in person again but also provide the opportunity for people to participate online and I know there's a lot of people uh, beaming in right now. Uh, the, the last two years have uh, certainly been challenging and I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room I always like to start by uh, uh, you know, ensuring that people take some time to process all that we've been through and uh, some people have uh, obviously lost loved ones and uh, some people have just lost opportunities and missed important milestones and, uh, and it's important to I think go through what we've been through and, and, and take some time to, to process all of that. But we, we know uh, here in British Columbia that the pandemic has been t uh, very difficult. It's been challenging for people in mental health, it's been challenging for our economy and I won't spend too much time going on on it just to say that um, you know we are fortunate in in British Columbia because we were able to keep construction open for majority of the pandemic we were able to keep uh, manufacturing open for much of the pandemic and I think that put us in a position uh, that uh, you know where we're leaders in not only in British Columbia but across the country but along with the pandemic we were also dealing with other impacts uh, we had three of the worst fire seasons in BC's history we had two of the worst floods in BC's history. So not only were we dealing with the impacts of the pandemic and how that was impacting people on the day to day, we were also dealing with climate change. And, and the idea that climate change is coming is no longer something that we think about. Climate change is here and we're dealing with the impacts of it every day. And so uh, as difficult as the last few years have been, uh, it's given us an opportunity, I think, to, to grow and learn. I've learned that at our best, we are a community. Throughout our province, we've been you know, shown through the pandemic that we look out after each other and we take care of each other. And I've seen it uh, many, many times how resilient our, our society and our community is. And so when we started uh, thinking about what the future of British Columbia will look like coming out of the pandemic, how do we take the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic and ensure that those lessons are reflected in the economic growth that we want to see going forward, we went about it in a different way. Uh, traditionally what happens with economic plans is uh, you meet with certain sectors, those in forestry, you meet with people in mining, you meet people in the construction industry and you ask them what it is that they want to see uh, for their sectors. We decided to take a different approach because what worked for us well in the pandemic was bringing people together uh, from all walks of life and navigating the pandemic together. We wanted to capture that moment as we went forward. So part of the work we did, part of the economic plan was we created 32 tables where we brought people together uh, from uh, resource development, from labor, from First Nations, uh, from academia, uh, even environmental organizations. And we created these tables where we brought people together and we had discussions about what it is that they want to see in the economy coming out of the pandemic. What are the lessons we learned and how can we build a stronger economy uh, coming forward? And what we found was that people uh, agreed more than they disagreed. And I know that we hear a lot of rhetoric on the news and on TV, conversations have become more and more polarized. And so this exercise of building this economic plan was about bringing people together about what we value and what we want to see as we go forward. And what we heard clearly and what's reflected in our economic plan is people want to see uh, both clean and inclusive growth. Now, when we talk about inclusive growth, it means that those people who disproportionately uh, felt the impacts of the pandemic, uh, Dr. Henry, for those of you that are not here, uh, was our top doctor who often had a saying that we're, not, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. Uh, so we know that some people felt the impacts of the pandemic in, in a greater way. How do we ensure that they get an opportunity to benefit? But also, what we heard clearly from all sectors, what we have to have clean growth as we go forward. 
And so that leads us to one of the key pillars um, that, uh, that we have part of our action plan. And, and uh, I have become a bit of a mass timber geek, <laughs> as was uh, kind of uh, alluded to in the introduction, um, because for us in British Columbia, this is uh, a huge opportunity. Uh, we see this as, uh, as a triple word score. We get to bring rural and urban communities together. We get to build in a more sustainable way using our natural resources to create good paying jobs here in British Columbia, but also use innovation to drive this new technology forward and, and build housing in a faster way because we know we have huge housing pressures. So it's uh, for us a huge win, but we use the same model in our mass timber action plan as we did with our economic plan. So we brought together uh, engineers and architects, uh, local government officials, uh, those in the forest industry, um, uh, you know, bylaw officers, um, and First Nations leaders all together to discuss what we want to see and how we want to move forward on this plan. And the Mass Timber Action Plan, which will be available for those that want to read through it, uh, is, is I think a very, very exciting step for us going forward. And I'll go through a few of the, the pieces that I'm particularly excited about. The, the, one of the biggest pieces for us is uh, procurement. We know that in order to drive the type of change we want to see in our society, the type of uh, the change we want to see in our built environment, we have to take leadership in government. So what we have done is created, as was highlighted, one of the only uh, Office of Mass Timber Implementation offices that I'm aware of in the world. Uh, this office is dedicated to two parts, working internally as well as externally. Internally, uh, the Ministry of Finance and Treasury Board has put a mandate on every single building that comes through public procurement that the province is building has to have a business case for mass timber be built into it. So now it's not a, it would be a nice thing to do, but now we are using procurement within government to say, can this be built with mass timber? Tell us the numbers so that we can make a decision accordingly. So that means uh, now new buildings like uh, the Royal BC Museum, new warehouses being built, uh, student housing that's being built across the province, care homes that are being built across the province will be using mass timber in them. So we're using public procurement to drive that demand so that we can see uh, some more manufacturing come online and create some pathways uh, uh, for the private sector. But also so we can share learnings along the way. Uh, another uh, key initiative that we have is we are actually partnering with FII, which I know is represented here, uh, to fund private sector developments. So not providing 100% funding, but providing some dollars to help address green premiums that many developers face. We know that it's easy to continue to do things the way we've been doing them. We've been doing it for a long time. We've been using the same products. And there's a bit of a fear in changing to a new product. So what we've done is, uh, in partnership, we've provided millions of dollars to provide private sector projects to give them an opportunity uh, to use mass timber in their development so they can learn, they can grow locally, they can see that it can be done in a, in a not only a sustainable way, but also it can be done in a cost-effective way. Some of those projects, uh, I can go on a long time about many of these projects, but we are building the first post-disaster fire hall in Saanich which will be built out of mass timber. Um, it's again one of the first, I believe, uh, that we've heard of in, in the world where it'll be a post-disaster fire uh, structure, fire uh, hall that will be built for the purpose of um, dealing with post-disaster but also to show that mass timber uh, can be used in different types of buildings. Uh, we have a building here in Vancouver which uh, will be, I believe, 14 stories, uh, which will have no concrete or steel in the actual structure. Uh, it'll be the first using mass timber bracing uh, in this structure. Uh, and we're using, uh, as I highlighted, public procurement to uh, drive that demand, but we also know that training people is going to be vitally important. We have to have our workforce scaled up so that as we transform and as we see more buildings come online, we have the workforce to support it. So we have a, a brand new $105 million uh, brand new facility that's being built at BCIT, which was highlighted by our previous speaker, I think, as well, um, which will be built from Mass Timber, uh, but also will house the new training center for developing the skills we know we know are going to be needed in this sector. 
it's very exciting to be able to not only have students learn about this, but also be able to build and be working hands-on in the building that they're going to be uh, learning in, in in the future. Uh, another building I'll highlight is uh, a new uh, student housing at UVic. 800 beds that are coming online. Some have opened up, some will be opening up soon. Uh, it is a beautiful new building in Victoria, which is not only mass timber, but built at Passive House Standard, which will be one of the largest uh, buildings uh, in uh, the lower uh, island uh, built at this standard. So we're uh, super excited about it and as a province we're going all in. I think we have 307 uh, buildings that are either complete or in the process of being built out of mass timber. Um, BC has more than the United States uh, combined and so we're taking this advantage that we have early on to really drive this. So instead of uh, what has happened in the past where we focus on um, uh, you know the manufacturers of CLT uh, and just focus on them, what we're doing is we're we're using this to drive the demand and, and then hoping that the private sector, which we're already seeing signals, will see that signal and bring on the supply on board. And the last thing I want to leave you with today, I know there's a lot of great speakers you're going to hear from, is that uh, there's a big shift happening in local governments. And right now we are in municipal elections uh, here in British Columbia, for those that are not from here. And what we're hearing more and more is residents are demanding that we start looking uh, at a local level at how we can build more sustainably, how we can start addressing a body carbon in our built environment. The pressure is coming. And so as I talk to many developers uh, in, in, in British Columbia, I tell them that it's not, it's not a matter of if this will come, it's, it's just a matter of when. And it's coming really fast. People are demanding this change and local governments are starting to see that there's a real benefit for this to be moving forward. Communities like Langford, which are now looking at moving every single mass timber project to the front of the queue to help address the potential green premium that may come with it so that they can see the type of development they want to see in their community. Because their, their residents are demanding this of them. And so what we're urging as a government is uh, everyone to take the leap forward, start making these steps. It, it'll be much more expensive later uh, than it is uh, now if you don't take this opportunity. But local governments are seeing the real benefit because what they're seeing right now is faster construction, which we know we need housing on. They're seeing less noise, so it means less residents complaining to them about uh, noise. And they're also seeing less disruption to local businesses because there's less people working on site, less trucks coming on. So they're seeing huge benefits beyond the benefits of, uh, of course, of um, having sustainable buildings. And so for us, we're really excited about the work that's happening. We're using government to drive that change. Uh, you're the leaders in this space. We certainly hope to see uh, many of you uh, engaging in this space. And the fact that you're here and this amazing conference is being put on, it means that there's an excitement and a real movement in this space. And so I want to thank the previous speaker uh, for his words. I appreciated the work that he's highlighted. Uh, I was. I found myself nodding the entire way through in the back and I want to thank the other speakers that will come in the very near future as well and uh, again thank you to the organizers for letting me say a few words and I wish you the best uh, at the rest of this conference so thank you so much